Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on pre-analytical mysteries from the PFLM. Um, first, some, uh, uh, some instructions. Please um, be aware this session gets recorded. So um, if you want to look at it later on, you are free to do so in the EFLM section, the webinar or e-learning section of the EFLM. Uh, in the section of recorded uh, webinars. Also, please uh, remember to um, attend the quiz after this uh, webinar. There will be a quiz on the website which you can um, which you can perform. And if you do so, you get the certificate of attendance for this webinar. Okay. Uh, today we will. Um, uh, um, have uh, Professor Vermeersch uh, from Belgium as a speaker. Professor Vermeersch is working as a clinical pathologist at the University Hospital of Leuven. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, apart from his chairmanships and memberships in several academic societies, he's also the past president of the Royal Belgian Society of Laboratory Medicine. Professor Vermeer is the Belgian corresponding member of the EFLM working group in uh, pre-analytics uh, since January 2017. He's an expert in the field of pre- and post-analytical phase optimization, including test interpretation of diagnostic tests and metabolic diseases. He has authored and co-authored way over 100 peer-reviewed articles and won several scientific prizes. And today, Professor Vermesh will present some interesting pre-analytical cases to us, and you are all invited to participate in solving these mysteries. Professor Vermesh, please. Thank you, Jana, for this kind introduction. Good evening, everyone, dear colleagues. I would like to talk to you this evening about pre-analytical mysteries and how these can help us to improve the quality of our pre-analytical phase and identify potential uh, weaknesses. If we think about laboratory tests, we have to think about the brain-to-brain -brain cycle. In fact, when we think about the laboratory test, the whole process starts with the clinician who has a medical question. Uh, when he is uh, looking at his patient, he requests a test. Then we have obviously the sampling. The patient has to be identified. The tubes can have to be drawn. The patient might require some special preparation and the tubes have to be identified. This is obviously a critical step in the entire process. Subsequently, the samples might require special conditioning, have to be transported to the laboratory where they might require special preparation, could be just centrifugation or more elaborate preparations. The analysis is then performed. Many analyses today are performed on highly automated analyzers, which allows us to uh, to have a very good analytical quality. Then the results are validated. These might require special interpretation. A report is sent to the clinician who can then read and interpret the report and hopefully make a medical decision which has impact on his patient based on the laboratory test results. The pre-analytical phase can be uh, defined as all the steps preceding the laboratory analysis as such. The fact that we are today also talking about the pre-analytical phase is that the pre-analytical phase is a major source of errors and the most vulnerable part of the total testing cycle. In fact, it is the, the site of more than 60% of errors in the total testing cycle, as has been studied uh, extensively by the group of Professor Plebani. Peter, Typical just, may I just interrupt yes. uh, just a second, just uh, some, some something else. If you should have any questions to Professor Vermeersch during the talk, just please uh, write them in the chat and we will discuss them after the talk. Sorry for the interruption. So the pre analytical phase is the major source of errors. This has been extensively studied by the group of Professor Plebani and typical errors include patient identification, insufficient tube filling, collecting the wrong tube, requesting or performing the wrong test. In fact, if you want to improve the quality of the pre-analytical phase, 
we need to be aware of the fact that typical solutions to improve the quality, such as training, standardization, and quality control, are challenging to implement and to maintain for the pre-analytical phase. This is at least in part due to the fact that many different people are involved, including clinicians, patients, paramedical staff, including nurses, logistics personnel, etc., which makes standardization and training more challenging than for the analytical phase. In our hospital, for example, we have over 2,000 nursing staff. A large part of the pre phase also takes place outside the direct control of the laboratory, making it also more complex not only to monitor the pre phase, but also to implement improvements. The Achilles heel of the pre phase is patient identification and sample identification. It is outside the scope of this talk to uh, extensively discuss possible solutions, but I would try to, like to give you a brief idea of how we are working so that you can also appreciate some of the cases. We are using patient wristbands for a number of years. We also have the possibility for electronic pre-ordering, which is uh, used both for the out outpatient clinic and the uh, inpatients. And we have the ability to print, in fact, the, um, the barcodes at the time of sampling for the outpatient clinic. It is also important to Appreciate that pre analytical procedures should not only be foolproof, the typical standard for a laboratory procedure, but also be abuse proof. There are a number of typical examples for this. The first is, for example, if you uh, start um, forcing people to scan their, the barcode of their ID for, for performing, for example, point of care testing, the most frequently scanned barcode typically tends to be a brick of milk or some other uh, item. Uh, in the neighborhood of the point of care device. The point is that it's very difficult to uh, solve this kind of problems because the nursing staff will always say, yes, but if somebody forgot his or her batch, etc., there's an emergency, we need to be able to perform point of care analysis, etc. But in the end, obviously, the exception becomes the rule. Another typical example, which a colleague of mine uh, had at his hospital, was that they introduced patient wristbands, but at one of the wards, they had, uh, let's say, an, uh, a solution which was adapted to their uh, personal uh, taste for the fact that they had to uh, scan all the time during their routine activities. So they hang a spare copy of all the wristbands at the nursing station, where they could then scan the wristband and the drugs and even the transfusion bags instead of doing this bedside. This is obviously an error which can have major consequences. And a typical problem in the prenatal phase is that the end users simply do not understand that uh, something can go wrong for something so simple and that this can have dramatic effects. A typical illustration which we have every month in our hospital of this kind of uh, abuse proof uh, standard is the fact that we have every month at least one sample of uh, lithium heparin blood which in fact uh, uh, happens to be EDTA blood. So people are not only uh, taking off the stoppers but even pouring over the content of the small EDTA tube into the larger uh, lithium heparin tube. So even we, though that we train everybody and that we will, will have special triggers for this, this will happen every month. So it is very difficult to avoid this kind of problems. The first important step in improving the quality, obviously, is standardization of pre-analytical processes. In this regard, I would like to mention the EFLM uh, recommendation for venous blood sampling, which has recently been issued by the working group PRE, which uh, can help us improve quality by standardization. Obviously, if you want to standardize, you have also uh, to train your personnel and assess the competency. And the EFLM working group for the prenatal phase also provides some tools for this. There are some movies about uh, blood sampling. This is Janne uh, on the right side, uh, who is a volunteer for, this, for these movies, and also a number of questions which can be used for competency assessment. We will assume for the rest of the talk that we are working in an environment where the personnel is trained and competency is assessed. If you want to improve the quality of the prenatal phase, another typical step will be to try to have quality indicators which allow us to monitor the analytical phase and to monitor the effect of continuous improvement. 
similar to our approach to the analytical phase. An important step in this regard has been the development of a number of quali quality indicators for the pre-analytical phase by the IFCC Working Group for Laboratory Errors and Patient Safety. It is in fact an ISO 15189 requirement to establish quality indicators and monitor and evaluate laboratory performance throughout critical aspects of the pre-examination, examination and post-examination phase. We did a recent survey with our working group, however, and found that a significant number of European laboratories who are accredited according to ISO 15189 are not measuring any quality indicators for the pre-analytical phase. This is an essential step to improve quality. Once again, we will assume that we are working in an environment where we are monitoring already this kind of quality indicators, but even then it, will, it is crucial that we are always on our guard. In fact, we need to treat the pre-analytical phase similar to the analytical phase, where we also have a system with quality controls, which are run at regular intervals, but we are still anxious about the fact that a sudden problem can occur. In fact, I tend to tell our trainees always that clinical chemistry is living on the edge. It is living with a constant fear of imminent failure. The same, in fact, is true for the pre-analytical phase. A typical problem also of the pre-analytical phase is that some of the problems might only occur at very specific parts of the pre-analytical phase or even only at very specific wards where people are trying to develop their own, let's say, uh, personalized solution uh, which could have uh, a negative impact on the quality. Pre-analytical mysteries, in fact, should trigger us to try to identify weaknesses in the pre-analytical phase and are according to myself, essential to identify these weaknesses. During the next 20 to 25 minutes, I will try to illustrate with a number of cases some of the potential weaknesses that I and some colleagues have identified based on pre-analytical mysteries. The first case I would like to talk to you about is the case of a 13-year-old Egyptian child with developmental delay who came to Belgium for a diagnostic workup. As part of this workup, a number of routine samples for hematology and clinical chemistry were taken, including also some uh, infectious disease testing, and also some testing was done for inborn errors of metabolism. The results of the uh, organic acid analysis, in fact, showed increase of propionic acid and methyl citric acid, two acids which are suggestive of a diagnosis of propionic acidemia. Propionic acidemia, in fact, however, typically presents at birth during the first days. In my career, all patients that I have identified with propionic acidemia, that's a limited number, of course, because the disease is relatively rare, we talk about six, seven patients in 10 years, have presented within the first five days of life. So a late diagnosis is somewhat, um, somewhat suspicious. To rule out any possible in-lab errors with identification, I asked for the working lists with all the samples to see whether any other patients were tested for metabolic diseases who were known with propionic acidemia. This was not the case. And I asked to reanalyze the original sample, starting from sample preparation to see whether it gives the same results. Organic acid analysis, like toxicology analysis, typically re is, requires quite some manipulations in the laboratory, including extraction, derivatization, transfer to a vial for GCMS testing, which also increases the risk of identification errors. So no identification error in the lab could be demonstrated. So the next step I took was to contact uh, my clinical colleague and tell him about my suspicion about this somewhat unexpected finding. Moreover, I was somewhat um, also triggered by the relatively low levels of methyl citric and propionic acid which reminded me of a patient that I had seen before with propionic acidemia who had a liver transplant. A liver transplantation will, uh, let's say, um, will help the patient not to have any severe metabolic crisis anymore, but does not make, uh, does not fully repair the defect in the entire body. So levels of propionic acid and methyl citric tend to be lower in these patients. I explained uh, the clinician, so the pediatrician, that I was suspicious and asked him to send a new sample. 
the sample was immediately analyzed and was negative. But the next day, I got a surprise call from the pediatrician who explained me then that, in fact, a patient with propionic acidemia had been admitted at the ward, and this patient had a liver transplant. For at the same time as our 13-year-old Egyptian child, this patient, however, was admitted for respiratory tract infection and didn't have any metabolic testing. This case uh, shows uh, how even, let's say, not only a sample mix-up can happen, but a complete, uh, a complete uh, failure of, let's say, the identification process. This was most likely triggered by the fact that the nurses knew this patient with propionic acidemia and obviously thought if an organic acid analysis was required, which is relatively rare, this was obviously going to be for this patient. This case prompted us to think about identification of sampling on the wards. Urine samples, in fact, pose a particular problem because at the moment you request the sample, you do not yet have the sample, and you cannot just always ask the patient to uh, pee to have an, a fresh urine sample. That means that there is always typically some delay there between the time of, this, of the request and the time that the sample is taken. Possibilities that we have considered is uh, trying to uh, label also the sample at the moment that, we, that uh, it is, uh, let's say, collected from the patient. Uh, but this would, for example, require us to have printers in all the rooms or have uh, wireless uh, barcode printers. This is not so easy, obviously, because you need a good Wi-Fi signal. Uh, so we are currently still considering what is possible. And one of the solutions could be pre barcoded tubes. So this prompted us to think about this entire process and how we could uh, improve this. The second case I would like to show you is a case uh, from a colleague. Uh, in fact, uh, the reference is uh, given below. A in very interesting uh, case, in fact, of a 71-year-old lady who was admitted to the emergency room with altered mental status. The urine toxicology, however, didn't match at all the reported medication use as shown here. The patient was prescribed, according to the patient records, an antipsychotic, an anti-Parkinson drug, a number of cardiovascular drugs, including a beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and a statin, and metformin for diabetes. However, the drug screen revealed, and confirmation with mass spectrometry, revealed the presence of a tricyclic antidepressant, an SSRI, clozapine, an atypical antipsychotic, and the antiepileptic valproic acid. These drugs could obviously explain the altered mental status of the lady, but these were definitely not prescribed to this lady. The clinician called the lab, in fact, to, to uh, tell the lab that he suspected a sample mix-up in the laboratory. A quite typical case, the clinician had asked the, the, the nursing staff, who were 100% sure that the, that the sample was from the right patient, so the clinician was, was sure that a mix-up had occurred in the laboratory. The trainee in laboratory medicine, however, was suspicious and had a look at the patient file, which interestingly revealed that six months before, the same lady had been admitted to the emergency room with similar uh, altered mental status problems and with the same drugs in the urine. This prompted a thorough uh, investigation, which ended up revealing that, in fact, the drugs that were found in the urine were the drugs that were prescribed to the roommate of the patient. This clearly shows you that the problem can, in fact, even be upstream of the hospital. This mix-up had happened at the nursing home where the lady was staying, and this shows that solving a pre-analytical mystery can clearly improve patient safety. The third case that I would like to talk to you about is the case of a four-year-old child with an apparent urine sample mix-up. The laboratory technician uh, called me to say that the, she, they received two samples from metabolic testing uh, from the same time of preservation, 11.30 in the morning, with different colors and different creatinine concentrations. In fact, there was a five-fold difference in uh, creatinine concentration. Based on these results, obviously, uh, we suspected a potential mix-up, and I told the, the technicians not to analyze the results. I called the pediatrician, but the pediatrician reassured me that he was sure there was no problem since he was present when the samples were labeled. 
one obviously can ask himself how it is possible that you could have such uh, differing creatinine concentrations, but even that uh, was something that the clinician was not, uh, well, didn't have a problem with. Because he explained that it was common practice at the pediatric outpatient clinic for nurses to ask patients to already collect a urine sample if a small child had to go to the, to the loo before the doctor visit in case urine analysis would be necessary. If a child would go twice to, uh, to the toilet, obviously you would have two different samples which could have diverging creatinine concentrations. This is obviously a problem. We had uh, quite an interesting discussion about this because our IT system, in fact, tries to avoid that you have multiple, uh, multiple times the same test at the same time point. It tries to force you to only have one creatinine measurement. But in order to improve our pre-analytical uh, procedure from an efficiency point of view, we, do, we ask the wards, the outpatient clinic, to take to put the urine into tubes and not to send us urine collections. This means that we can have multiple tubes from the same time point. Obviously, one could argue here that the nurses shouldn't be doing this, but I think here we have to go for the uh, abuse-proof standard, not the foolproof standard, and you have to measure creatinine on every sample, as we did here, in order to avoid any uh, possible problems. I think it is impossible with 2,000 people working in a hospital and staff changing constantly that you would be able to try to enforce that people would uh, not do something like this. This uh, the extra cost for measuring the creatinine, which is not reimbursed, uh, is an extra cost, let's say, of uh, trying to maintain the quality of our uh, results. The next case I would like to show you is a case where we move more towards the laboratory. It is a case of a, comp of a problem with a high percentage, percentage of urine samples with bacterial overgrowth. This is also a case which I noted, in fact, and I had uh, noticed that a significant number of urine samples for organic acid analysis appear to have bacterial overgrowth. And these were samples from one referring laboratory. Indications here would be a pH above 7, increased citric acid inter cycle intermediates, 3-hydroxypropionic acid, 4-hydroxybenzoic acid. Uh, I noted this because e each of these samples is obviously uh, interpreted individually, and we always measure also the pH uh, in order to identify post potential um, contamination. Contamination is possible, obviously, if the sample is from a urine collection where the bag has, for example, been next to the patient for a number of hours, but you have several uh, cases of bacterial overgrowth, this is somewhat suspicious. I therefore decided to discuss this with the clinical pathologist of the repairing laboratory. He was surprised and said that in his laboratory, the instructions were clear. Urine, the urine sample should be frozen at minus 20 and kept frozen in the lab, and it should be transported on ice. He told me he was going to closely inspect the next shipments to make sure these were also on ice. The problem, however, persisted after a couple of weeks, and then I decided to also uh, inspect this myself, and I told our sample reception, our central sample reception, to contact me when the samples arrive. And I observed that uh, when the driver arrived from our subcontractor, he was putting the samples directly in the freezer and giving the documents to the secretary. The secretary was very happy with this because this meant uh, she had less work. But when I then looked at the samples in the freezer, I saw that these were torn. So the driver obviously uh, wasn't aware of the fact that uh, not keeping these samples frozen could cause, uh, could, could have a negative impact on the, of the, on the results. This is definitely the case for organic acid analysis, since detection of the intermediates, such as 3-hydroxypropionic acid and citric acid cycle intermediates, can be important for the diagnosis of certain specific inborn errors of metabolism. This clearly shows that it is important to always be on your guard for uh, minor changes uh, in the procedures and that good intentions might have uh, uh, negative consequences. To continue uh, with uh, the, let's say, sample transport, sample reception, I present you a case where we had unexpected negative results for porphyria testing in urine. Our laboratory is, in fact, a European reference laboratory uh, for porphyria in the framework of uh, APNET. And um, 
a refer laboratory was complaining that they were, had sent two samples for HPLC analysis for Euro and Copper porphyrins, but that these were in fact negative. Let's say there were, there were some Euro and Copper porphyrins, but the levels were low. So these were negative and this was unexpected. I asked our technicians also to reanalyze the samples. I also did the screening assay, spectrophotometry, which indeed showed some porphyrins presence, but indeed in a normal uh, amount. If you think porphyrins and prenatal phase one is obviously immediately thinking about the fact that porphyrins should, uh, or samples for porphyria testing should be shielded from light since porphyrins are light sensitive. I immediately had a look at our pre-analytical phase, and there I uh, indeed saw that an engineer had just performed a Lean Six Sigma project to optimize sample reception for samples from referring laboratories, and the pilot was running. The idea of Six Sigma is obviously very good. You try to first make a process which is lean, the minimum number of steps in order, eh, to, in order to, re to reduce waste, and Six Sigma wise also reduce the number of potential errors. An extensive study was performed where the old process, let's say, was completely, uh, completely uh, 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 investigated, charts were drawn, samples were, were, were arriving, uh, you had a number of multiple handovers, and uh, samples were arriving first, a number of handovers were necessary during the old process, and the idea was now to introduce a pilot process where samples would arrive, and then follow the document the documents to the medical administration to the requester and hence to the laboratory here however good intentions again uh, <laughs> uh, were uh, leading to erroneous results the way to hell is in fact paved with good intentions a major point here would be the letters ma medical administration in order to keep our database as clean as possible our secretaries cannot, let's say, register new patients. Only one person for medical administration can do this because that patient, that person, will have to check whether there are no double entries, etc., and that all the identifiers are correct. However, when the when the person of the medical administration goes for a break, samples would be staying on the desk at room temperature, not shielded from light, and this was the cause of the two negative results. Based on this observation, the pilot was uh, halted and the procedure was changed and it was made clear that samples who uh, should be in the freezer or in the, or in the fridge cannot just be put on the desk. In fact, the referring laboratory was sending the samples in a box shielded from light, but the secretaries were just unpacking these samples and putting them on the desk. We will now proceed uh, further uh, upstream, let's say, to the more analytical phase again. This is an example of a nine-year-old girl who presented with protein-losing enteropathy, who had a uh, protein electrophoresis. In fact, the results of this uh, uh, protein electrophoresis showed an M-peak in the, in, the, in the beta fraction here, and uh, electro immunofixation was negative. This prompted us to call the clinicians, which revealed that the blood sample had been drawn via a venous axis during an angiocardiography procedure, because this patient also had uh, major, uh, major abnormalities uh, uh, for the great vessels uh, surrounding the heart. This is a, a problem that I regularly encounter, in fact, uh, samples which are drawn via catheters, uh, uh, where you have, for example, high amounts of uh, of, for example, antibiotics, because the sample is drawn in the arm below the site of the uh, administration of the drip of the antibiotics. This is something which is also almost unavoidable, but you should always be aware that this uh, can be the case. The next case is a case, in fact, we encountered relatively recently in our hospital, and this was a case where there was a sudden rise in clot errors for coagulation testing on a Sunday morning. In fact, a Saturday morning, my apologies, uh, the technician, in fact, noticed a sudden rise in clot errors on our track-coupled ACL top uh, analyzers. These are track-coupled. The samples, when they arrive, are put in a bulk impute model. They are uh, going via the track to the, to the ACL tops, and these ACL tops are checking for uh, filling, 
and are also checking for HLI indices. But there was, however, a sudden rise in clock errors. Visual inspection revealed, in fact, that um, there were a number of tubes with large clots, and in other tubes, small clots were uh, detected. The sudden rise, in fact, was here for the 27th uh, of uh, January, where we see indeed an, an increase from Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to Saturday, we have a sudden increase, which is obviously um, not expected since there are much less samples on, 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 week, on weekends than uh, during weekdays. A list query confirmed that there was an increase both in PT and APTT linked errors. And um, my colleague um, uh, was, in fact, uh, at the laboratory at that moment, and he uh, had a look at these tubes. And when he removed the barcode labels, which are obviously on top of the normal labels of the tubes, because otherwise you can't, uh, you can't visualize uh, the content of the tube. When he removed the labels, he noticed that all tubes were from the same lot. In fact, due to the relatively short stability of sideway tubes, we always have different lots in our hospital. And at this time, we had, in fact, seven different lots in our hospital. So the fact that all tubes were from one lot raised uh, a suspicion that there could be a problem there. In fact, inspection of seven unopened boxes, which we collected on the wards, revealed one box with nine empty tubes, two partially filled tubes, one box with two underfilled tubes, and seven normal boxes. The graph below illustrates that uh, here we, for example, have from this lot a normally filled tube, an underfilled tube, and an empty tube. This was most likely due to the fact that at the start of the production, one of the needles was blocked. The manufacturer immediately withdrew the tubes from the market. Uh, and this, unfortunately, had no negative consequences because uh, the PT and APTT results gave uh, errors. This is also an example where we then uh, immediately contacted all the wards to remove um, uh, the tubes. However, um, as was shown on the last tube, it took, uh, it took until uh, Wednesday to have again a day without any errors. So some of the tubes of these tubes were still circulating because they were in carts, etc., uh, throughout the hospital. Although we uh, immediately posted a notice to take these uh, tubes out of use. The next case is an interesting case about a 1.5 year old girl with failure to drive. Samples for this girl were sent at multiple occasions for uh, metabolic testing by referral hospital. And um, uh, in fact, I couldn't find any diagnostic evidence for an inborn error of metabolism, but I noticed that the urine creatinines were low, 1.3 milligrams per deciliter, 6.3 milligrams per deciliter. The organic acid concentrations were also relatively low, but that is relatively hard to interpret, however. Triggered by this relatively low results, I uh, looked for a creatine synthesis disorder, but this was normal. But I also had, did a measurement for osmolality, and osmolality was very low. This prompted me to call the treating pediatrician and ask him whether the child was not drinking a lot of water and maybe not eating enough. This, in fact, uh, prompted close observation during the next visit in the waiting room of uh, the mother with the girl. And this showed, and this uh, led to an episode where the child said she was hungry, but the mother refused to give the child a biscuit, but told the child to drink water. This led, in fact, to the diagnosis of a Munchausen by proxy, indicating that pre-analytical mysteries and, uh, can also uh, help us uh, uh, sometimes in diagnosis. These very low creatinines were indeed very suspicious. The next case I would like to uh, show you is a case of a 25-year-old patient tested for drugs of abuse. Samples uh, from this patient uh, were sent to our laboratory from a psychiatric hospital where patients with, a drug, uh, with, uh, with, um, with drug addiction are treated. And the sample tested positive for cannabinoids on immunoassay and the sample was referred for LC-MSMS analysis. However, upon opening the sample, the technician noticed, this, noticed a relatively weird smell. The sample was, however, yellow, eh, as you would expect uh, from uh, a normal urine sample, and creatinine was 5, which is also acceptable, but rather uh, low. 
A mix-up with apple juice, however, was suspected, and to confirm this, we did uh, an, 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 uh, an assay for reducing sugars, which gave a massive positive result. This uh, prompted us to call the, uh, the, uh, the addiction treatment center to tell them that the patient should be observed whenever he was giving a sample to make sure that he wasn't uh, doing any mixing. However, a couple of months later, we, get, we had again a sample which was uh, in fact negative for immunoassay testing, but which then consisted exclusively of apple juice. So we then called the treating uh, doctor, but the doctor said, yeah, but we are constantly, continuously uh, supervising this patient when he is uh, producing the sample, etc. But one can obviously doubt whether this is the case. This is, again, a pre-analytical mystery. Where we, can find, where we can see a certain weakness in the pre-analytical process, but where it is obviously not possible to directly solve this problem, uh, let's say, from the laboratory. The solution to this is to always measure creatinine in all samples that you, for which you do drug testing, but obviously this cannot prevent you uh, from um, having a positive or a measurable creatinine result in samples where you mix, for example, apple juice with urine instead of uh, sending pure uh, apple juice. The last case I would like to show you is a case um, illustrating also how IT problems can occur regarding the pre-analytical phase. In fact, this was a case where I was called regarding results for urgent testing for inborn errors of metabolism. A referring laboratory called on Friday evening to the lab for the results for a urine sample sent for urgent organic acid testing. The sample, however, was apparently never received. The clinical pathologist called me at home and I went to the laboratory to solve this issue. In the laboratory, I indeed had a, a look first in the, in the information system. No results could be found. And then I had a look at the recent results for organic acid analysis. And there I could find a patient with a similar name. The fact that the results could in fact not be found were due to a patient mix-up of the family names, but the patient mix-up which was in fact related to the way the IT system of the referring laboratory worked. The IT system of the referring laboratory in fact sent us a letter with just a name, with the first name and the last name combined. Like for my name, that would be Peter Josef Luc Vermeers and the date of birth. But obviously, the way the family name was interpreted by the referring laboratory and by our laboratory was different. So if we would be looking for Luc Vermeers and enter LUC instead of looking for Vermeers, we wouldn't be able to find any patient. This again was also related to the fact that on weekends we can't enter the patient data ourselves, as already discussed before, because the medical administration wants to keep the, the database clean, which is a good intention. But for that reason, we need to make emergency patients, and there is no good data, uh, data checkup. So this is an, a, an error, in fact, which would only have been identified on Monday morning when there would have been a double check with the, uh, with the government database. So this is also an example where IT can lead to erroneous results. Similarly, I would like to point to the uh, girl with the low creatinine. And a problem I also typically encounter is that laboratories are giving me the date of sampling, but not the time of sampling, which, for example, if you interpret Organic acid analysis can also be relevant, both for the creatinine, for example, but also if you have ketones in urine, that would not be so surprising for to have some traces early in the morning, but later during the day, that would raise some suspicions, for example, for ketolysis disorders. There are, however, several commercial systems which do not uh, uh, transmit the uh, time of sampling when uh, samples are referred. I would then like to conclude uh, my talk with a number of take-home messages. The first take-home message is that uh, the pre-analytical phase is in fact the most frequent cause of errors, accounting for more than 60% of errors. And the Achilles heel is obviously the patient and sample identification. I always say here that if in doubt, you need to ask for a new sample. If you, I always tell our students also, my medical students, if you reanalyze the original sample, you will typically get the same results. Precision is very good in laboratory medicine, but if you're obviously testing the wrong patient, you will have erroneous results. So 
if in doubt, always send a new uh, sample. The third whole message is that pre-analytical procedures should not only be foolproof, but also be abuse-proof as much as possible, at least. I think a number of uh, cases have illustrated this, such as the case with the two urine samples from the date, same uh, time of sampling with uh, widely varying uh, creatinines. This is something which I think you cannot avoid. You have to try to guard yourself against this, for example, by measuring also creatinine in each individual sample. I hope also that this presentation nicely illustrated to you how pre-analytical mysteries should be a trigger to identify systemic weaknesses in the pre-analytical process. I think this is uh, also why I'm always triggered by pre-analytical mysteries. These offer you a unique opportunity to identify, for example, identification problems at a specific ward. This is something, if you look at your quality indicators, that will be very hard to, uh, to identify, eh? since uh, these give a global overview, uh, while uh, the way of working at different wards can uh, differ uh, uh, significantly. Finally, uh, I think it's also essential to continue, continuously monitor the prenatal phase uh, uh, to maintain and improve quality, as was shown in the case of the sudden rise in preanalytical errors for clotted tubes. Uh, you always, let's say, have to be aware of a sudden deterioration of quality similar to what uh, can happen in the analytical phase. I would then like to thank you for your attention and uh, I would like to ask you if there are any questions uh, please feel free to post them. Janne, uh, I would yes. like to give the word to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Peter, for this very, very, very nice talk. Thank you a lot. Um, you presented some very impressive uh, pre-analytical cases, and I think we uh, now know that uh, pre-analytical processes are quite important. And also what we saw is that regardless of how trivial an error may look, uh, the consequences may be devastating uh, for the respective patients. Um, I would like to ask the participants to post their questions, if there are any, in the chat. Um, in the meantime, um, I would like to post a link in the chat also. Here you go. Um, this is the link where you can download uh, the uh, working group of pre-analytics um, uh, resources, one of which uh, Professor Vermeersch uh, just showed you, that was the uh, Venus sampling uh, guideline uh, for, for Europe, um, uh, as well as the educational tools such as the um, uh, videos and PowerPoints and um, uh, other educational tools there. They are free to download for you. Um, so, are there any questions? I monitored the chat closely while uh, while the talk. There were no questions, and also now here, there is nothing. There are some people still typing. I think we can wait a little more, Peter. What do you say? Certainly. Okay. I very I very much liked your. I wrote it down here. I very much liked your expression. The way to hell is paved with good <laughs> intentions. I didn't know that, but I really like. <laughs> Okay. No I question. The typical problem is that it's it's uh, it's very challenging to explain to people how things can go wrong in something as basic, let's say, as a blood draw, patient identification in an environment, let's say, let's say an intensive care ward where people are doing all kinds of monitoring, complex treatments, uh, etc. People. Yeah, that's yeah, people are just not not aware of this. Huh? So the intention, I think, is is definitely not usually there to uh, to cause major harassment, but uh, it's it's a lack of understanding. Huh? Exactly, this is my my impression also in my hospital that if you explain to people why uh, certain processes need to be done as we are we tell them to do, and that it may harm the patients uh, in, in consequence they mostly adhere to it. Okay, Peter, uh, here is a question. Do you recommend the use of gloves? In the picture of your slide, the phlebotomist doesn't wear it. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Well, maybe uh, 
Peter, can I can I yes, just Jana, please. I, I made this uh, I made this video. This is just a screenshot. So in the presentation in the video, you will see that gloves are worn, uh, and they're also recommended to be worn at, uh, at lobotomy. This is just um, um, it's a very short video, five minutes. You can you can download it and use it in your hospital for for education or else. Peter, what do you say? Do you do you recommend? We, re we recommend the use of gloves, yeah. <laughs> there is another one from Ana Alves. Um, sometimes errors are easy to detect when they are bizarre enough to make a question. It's hard to detect them, though, when they are not as noticeable. This is challenging. Yes, that's absolutely true. I think the EDTA example is a particular uh, problem there. Uh, as long as you just pour the EDTA blood in an empty tube, everything is okay. But if you start, let's say, mixing, eh, you have you don't have enough. Uh, you, you you don't have you don't have, for example, any EDTA blood because uh, because uh, after the the lithium heparin, you were not able to to retrieve more blood. So you put some of the lithium heparin blood in the EDTA tube, but oh, but there's nothing left anymore. You pour some back. If you start like this, obviously, this can cause major major problems and it's something which is close to impossible to detect almost eh? so um, we never had any any notifications that this occurred but obviously the question is whether <laughs> how we should have how we should have noticed eh? so uh, but certainly for the for the pediatric wards this is somewhat of a risk because people tend to use open systems eh? i mean for the neo neonatology eh? so there is definitely more of a risk that people clearly explain it that people try to to mix up eh? Well, you, you get a hint if you have high potassium values yeah. and low calcium values, then you, you get a little hint if, if there may be an EDTA contamination. But you're right, it's, it's, if it's just spurious, you, you're, you're lost. Yeah, we have an automatic trigger for it in the system if it's, let's say, clear enough. But yeah, if you have some minor, uh, minor changes there, that's, that's tricky, obviously. Yeah? Pina Ecker, a, a, a working group member here, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm, pre analytic working group member uh, asks you do you think we need human factor engineering tools for pa errors to prevent from i don't really understand the question pinar do you uh, I, do, I, don't, I don't know what you what exactly is meant with human factor engineering um, tools that that i would like to introduce in our hospital myself in fact would be um, would be a more individualized feedback that would be that we that we would try to, uh, for example, uh, we we in fact can identify everybody who is taking, for example, point of care uh, samples, who is taking routine blood samples. But for privacy reasons, we cannot record this in our system and link this to preanalytical errors, to, for example, uh, hemolysis indices, etc. Something I would like to do is uh, is try to make some tools where we could let's say uh, automatically so no person who has a, a shameless let's say automatically contact the people we, who have let's say um, um, who are outliers for some of these pre-analytical quality indicators or the wards with some suggestions like the movies of the working group uh, to improve their quality but that is let's say somewhat of a of a, of a difficult process because this would obviously mean collecting <laughs> uh, kind of personalized data which could allow you to do some shaming eh? so that's somewhat uh, somewhat tricky so there's a difference between you need to scan and obviously using this uh, in a way to assess uh, continuous assess quality um, at an individual level that's somewhat uh, tricky so we have some issues there because these people are not working for us we have another question um again for for venous blood collection what is your opinion on using gloves already at the time of choosing the puncture site um well maybe i can i can uh, um, uh, answer that too um i i highly recommend you, you go to this link and download um uh, the uh, the guide the consensus guideline um uh, basically, when you're choosing the puncture site, you don't need to, to uh, wear gloves, but afterwards you have to, to clean the puncture site and to take gloves. And once you've cleaned the puncture site, you're not allowed to touch it. So this is, this is what basically is written in this, in this uh, uh, consensus guideline, which you can download freely. Um, 
What do you say, Peter? Do you, are you oh. agreeing? Or? I wouldn't know what to do there. I think that's uh, somewhat... Uh, most people do, I think. I, I, would, I would use gloves, but uh, if you have good, uh, let's say, good, good hospital hygiene, I think as long as if you have uh, that there's no problem on, for not wearing gloves if you're looking for the puncture site. Eh? But yeah, that's, I think it's better to, to always perform the same procedure, obviously, and I would suggest to wear gloves from the start era. Eh? Okay. How are you doing it in your hospital, Jana? Um, well, I don't know every word, but I can just tell you how we do it in the in the laboratory, and this is just exactly how it's how it's proposed by the by the working group. Um, what we just now are uh, um, uh, trying to use or we, uh, is this uh, um, Wayne Finder. I don't know if you've heard of that um, uh, device where you uh, can can project on the site of lobotomy. Which shows you the veins. Um, I think it is with infrared or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of a kind of a nice tool. We have another we have another glove tool. A uh, glove question, Peter. Yeah. What's about what's about gloves with powder? Is it possible to interfere with some analysis, calcium, for example? I don't have any experience with that. I don't have any experience yeah. with that either. No. Okay. We in fact tend to use uh, to use powderless gloves as much as possible, also because of the allergy. Let's say eh? the special, so not the latex, but uh, we have a lot of uh, of the nitrile gloves, etc. In our hospital, okay. we have another question. Considering the human factor, it is quite clear that continuous education of all personnel and especially patients and monitoring of all moments in the process is crucial for good quality in the pre-analytical phase. Well, this is actually a statement, and not a, a, a which I can highly underline. Mm -hmm. um, another question, um, but here in one of the cases you presented, there was emergency test requesting. Is your lab mm -hmm. analyzes emergency requesting on time? Um, well, it is very difficult, we, I think. That's right. For in-house patients, we do it. For our own patients, for our own program, we do it. In fact, seven days a week. So, but that would be very rare. I don't. I'm not aware of other people doing this. Is this a must? You can discuss. I think. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can claim this is a must. Huh? So, um, but for in-house, for our own patients, we do it. Uh, we do it also uh, in weekends. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Ah, here we are. The yeah. gloves with powder are forbidden for yeah. production by CREA. Also, yeah, I have a lot of allergies, so uh, <laughs> there, so... Okay, I don't see anyone typing anymore, and they, there were a lot of questions right now. Um, if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you once again, Peter, for this mm -hmm. very nice talk, and uh, to all the participants for adhering throughout the, the complete talk um, at this at this late hour um, and uh, as I mentioned please be aware that uh, this uh, session got recorded you can uh, look at it uh, later on and if you want to have a certificate of attendance you need to go to the EFLM um, e-learning site and download the quiz uh, not download but make the quiz and after that you will receive the uh, the certificate of attendance. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much, all of you. And I wish you a nice evening. Okay. Bye -bye. Goodbye.